Hillary Wilkinson doesn't usually wear a cape or a skin-tight bodysuit, but she could totally pull it off. Her super senses first became apparent as smartphones started becoming more ubiquitous. You know how your your mama spidey senses are tingling and you're like, I don't know why I don't like this, but something is here. Since then, her mission has become clear, helping families navigate the screen time universe. This is the How She Moms podcast with Whitney Archibald. I'm a mother of five on a mission to help moms connect with your kids, manage your homes, and create your own unique version of motherhood. I curate ideas from different moms so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. Today, we're continuing our series about managing screen time with the crusader for connection herself, Hillary Wilkinson. Hillary is a founding member of Healthy Screen Habits, a nonprofit organization dedicated to researching and spreading awareness about the effects of screen time on kids and families and what we can do to create healthy habits. Hillary hosts a fantastic podcast by the same name, Healthy Screen Habits, that I've learned so much from. Plus, as you'll soon see, Hillary is a delight. Highly recommend. She's going to tell the story about how she helped start this organization, talk to us about some of the research about kids and screens, walk us through some safeguards we can put in place, and teach us some healthy screen habits. We're going to just jump right in and let Hillary finish introducing herself. So I have a 15-year-old and a 19-year-old. So awesome. that's where we're at. So okay. they're both sophomores. They're I've got a sophomore in high school and a sophomore in college. So you have and run I know the gamut what you mean. of tech tech situations with those two. I have. I have. And I also am really selfishly grateful that the smartphone really didn't kind of reach this like ubiquitous status in American culture until about 2012. Was So the smartphone came out in 2007. And uh, there were, you know, the front runners, the early adopters that got it. And then it didn't really hit that tipping point of over 52% of the American population owning smartphones until 2012. Okay. Now, the reason why I know these statistics is not great. The reason why I know these statistics is because when you look at, and this is from like National Institutes of Mental Health, it's like you look at the graph line that goes up and down on, you know, we're talking about like major depressive episodes, self-reported depressive episodes, you know, sadly suicide, et cetera. And it kind of like bumps along and does the regular thing that you see on any type of graph going up and down. And then it hits 2012. And I tell you what, Whitney, it takes off and it's never come down since. And so at that point, I had kids that were past the toddler stages. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, it's ironic that I'm in this healthy screen habits forum because I, I'm a very late adopter. I, I am not somebody, I'm somebody that approaches things with skepticism. I'm like, Hmm, you know, I, Um, and we live a very low tech life. So, I mean, tech is fantastic and amazing, I think, but it also is something that we have to look at with a great deal of caution and care, you know, before we bring it into our own homes and our own families. So that's, uh, that's really where, where we are with that. So how did you being kind of low tech get into this healthy screen habits? mission. Okay. So my background is in education. I my, you know, early background is in child psych. And then I went into education after that. And what I was seeing as my kids were developing was an increase in disconnection amongst both parents and children. Mm -hmm. And I didn't I, I, it was one of those things where like, you know, how your, your mama spidey senses are tingling and you're like, I don't know why, I don't know why I don't like this, but something is here. And what happened was, and this is one of those proponents for the whole, like build your tribe, (laughs) you know, there started being a group of like-minded moms in our 
town that we all hung out together and we kind of like had agreed, Hey, like we kind of made an informal pact of we're not doing the cell phone thing until the summer after eighth grade. And this was before we even knew about now there are organizations like wait until eighth and all of that, you know, we didn't even know about that, but all of our, our parenting conversations started having this same nucleus of how are we handling tech in our families? Like, what are the, what are the issues? And like it or not, we started kind of becoming a local resource for a lot of parents. And so at that point, Juliana Lorenzen, who is our executive director, she kind of said, okay, let's get serious about this guys. And that's, so we founded in 2018 and I'm really glad that we did prior to the pandemic and shutdown, because so then it kind of things started just taking off and we were doing a ton of presentations and we were at schools and PTAs and churches. And then of course the world closed. And so everything fell off the map and the pandemic pivot for myself, after we figured out how to do schooling and everything with my children was the, the podcast. So that's what started the healthy screen habits podcast, which that's, that's how you and I found each other. So right. <laughs> we're going to fast forward through some nerdy podcasting talk here and resume when we started talking about how technology feeds our natural curiosity. And that's part of the pull of technology is, you know, the, how do I figure this out part? And so that's, I mean, it's very understandable how our kids get pulled into it because they're in this heightened state. They are, you know, wired for trying to figure things out. So that's, well, they're wired for it and all the companies understand how they're wired. And so they're then, well, in some cases exploiting, not all cases exploiting, but see that receptiveness and they fill every little chink, every little need. <laughs> you, you, you can, I cannot overemphasize the power of persuasive of design, which is what you're talking about, yeah. where they took the best of both worlds and they continue to t- take the best of both worlds where, you know, technology, like medical technology have evolved concurrently with all of the stuff that we know and appreciate and enjoy that sit on our desktops at home. And so medical technology was also allowing us to have a peek inside our skulls, right? And going, Ooh, what areas light up? Ooh, what charges this? What, you know, what is this thing called dopamine that were, I mean, it really just shed a light on so many things through the functional MRIs. So big tech did smart things. I mean, these are very smart people we're talking about who are designers, you know, and they said, Hey, brain scientists come work with us and we'll figure out, you know, how to, how to make this appeal and draw people in. And at some point, it starts taking a turn towards the dark side, but I'm not, I'm not meaning to come from that place. I come from a place of extreme hope. I really do. I think the more that we build awareness and I'm such a fervent believer in parent education. I just think the parents of today are so active in seeking the very best knowledge to do the best by their children. I, I, I'm just, I love what I see happening and the shift that I have seen happening in the time that I've been part of healthy screen habits. When I can tell you, Whitney, back in 2018, I used to go and do presentations for like mothers of preschoolers and stuff like that, you know, talking about the developing brain and how, like, we really have to be careful about how we're introducing, how we're, how we're, um, you know, a outsourcing caregiving to the lowest common denominator, you know, of entertainment. So be very careful with that, but also we're seeing other things like language delays. We're seeing eye involvement where, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that is very concerning. I used to be looked at like, I think the person who stands on the soapbox with the big sign. I mean, people in the crowd would kind of look at me like, I think she's a little crazy. Like, I understand what she's (laughs) saying, but I think she's a little crazy, you know? And the way they'd kind of shy away from me after I (laughs) get down on my soapbox. And I, I have to tell you, 
I, there were a couple of things that happened. I think, you know, the, the release of the social dilemma on Netflix yeah. was life changing in the digital wellness field, because all of us, you had it condensed into a format that was readily accessible. You know, the research and the developers who are now going, oh, oh, we didn't intend for the tech to be used this way. But now, you know, you can't put that genie back into the bottle. So it's up to us to develop you know, guardrails for how are we going to keep kids safe? I mean, tech today was not designed for children and it continues to be problematic. I mean, with the very worst consequences in a lot of social media circumstances and the streaming addictions that include the pornography exposure and sextortion and I'm all of the very, very dark places you can go. But I, I have to believe in the good of humanity or I will not last. And that I think that the very people who created a lot of these platforms, A, now are older and they're having children mm -hmm. and they are looking back and having their come to Jesus moment of, oh, what has happened here? And so I do believe that they cannot help but recognize the importance of, of putting into place guardrails, which is what we're seeing with the introduction of like the, the COSA act, which is the kids online safety act. Yeah. It's KOSA. Okay. But it's a bipartisan bill. And so uh, everybody, <laughs> it is one of the things that like our country can agree on is yeah. that no matter what side you stand on, everybody agrees that our kids need the very best, which is, you know, you look at the numbers, half of their day is spent on screens, whether it's on education or entertainment or anything else. Well, and it just so occurred to me as you were talking that our playgrounds have gotten almost like too safe, like all of our, you know, all the physical things have gotten almost too safe, like kids aren't climbing trees and doing all those things while this other wild, wild West online is the real danger. You know, it's, it's like, we're, that is, you have hit the nail on the head where so many times we have this false sense of safety because our kid is on the couch. I can see them, <laughs> right. you know, or our kid is, you know, down the hall in the room, yeah. talking to his friend online. I can hear him like our, our natural built-in mama instincts are assuaged of, you know, feeling anxious because, oh, they're right there. Never realizing that actually what's going on could be far more dangerous than them falling off the monkey bars. Yeah. You know, I welcome the skinned knees and the scraped elbows over the long lasting damage that can occur online yeah. with unchecked use with, you know, so that's why it's important that families, do you want me to get into schools people can use, or sure. is that? Yeah. Okay. So we recommend putting up the guardrails, of course, with like, they're monitoring platforms like bark. And, you know, I mean, it's it, the, here's, what's tricky is there are nearly as many platforms out there as you can think of, whether it's Disney circle or family, you know, fam, family plan and all of this stuff, you can Google and find as many of these subscription programs, et cetera, that will send you alerts and warnings and uh, all of that. That's great. Okay. You know what we also do every time we get in the car, we put on our seatbelts, you know, I mean, that's just a basic thing. Okay. So you can kind of think it gets into this whole like Swiss cheese theory of danger management, where if I have one layer of Swiss cheese, let's say like our, our technology with no plans in place is just one slice of Swiss cheese. Well, we've got lots of holes that we can go through there yeah. that the, the holes being the places where all of the issues that come from extended online use can happen, you know, whether yeah. it's addiction, whether it's predators 
fingers, whether whatever, right? Well, so get another piece of Swiss cheese and lay it over the top of that one. And you're going to see some of the holes are covered. And so maybe that's your monitoring plan. Yeah. Okay. You'd get another piece of Swiss cheese, put it over the top of that. And there we're talking about going with like a Griffin router. Okay. And the router is actually more of a gateway to your home. Okay. So that's like the third piece of Swiss cheese. I want to tell you what's going to give you the best coverage, like the piece of like, <laughs> clearly I'm a foodie, the piece of like <laughs> mozzarella over the uh -huh, top, of got it. It, you know, honestly, you cannot beat anything than the parent child connection. Mm -hmm. Your relationship with your child is the number one thing of importance. It cannot replace any electronic service. It cannot, I mean, just frequent check-ins, talking. I, I can't, I can't tell you enough. You know, it's not like you can have one talk. When we teach our kids to tie their shoe, I don't know, maybe you have gifted children who learned how to tie their shoe in one, you know, one soup. It's like, oh, you just do this. You loop this, goes around the tree trunk, the bunny comes through and there we go. You know, I mean, it takes lots and lots of times before they're ready. And sometimes, you know what, it's easier to do the slip ons, <laughs> just, but, mm -hmm. or it's like most, most things that we teach our kids, we give lots of repeated exposure and lots of examples of how to do things the right way. So like I said, I have teenagers. I've taught one of them to drive. We're in the process of teaching our second one to drive. And I just, I mean, when we're in the car, it's kind of like, I open up the top of my head and I narrate what I'm noticing, what I'm seeing when I'm, when, when I'm driving or when she's driving, I'm like, Oh, now I'm looking ahead. And I see that that light down there has been green for a long time. If I know that light's been green for a long time, I'm also noticing there's a car there that's at the intersection. That light's going to be turning yellow. You know, sure enough, it'll start turning yellow. So you're also narrating the positive outcomes and predictions of what can happen yeah. because yeah, it's important that we show our kids the right way to use technology, not just the don't do this, don't share passwords, don't do, don't talk to anybody you don't know, don't do this. You know, it's so important that, so in my house, part of what we do is training for social media and you go through and there are all kinds of studies. This is the benefit of having your mom be the healthy screen habits nerd. <laughs> right. You get subject to all this research, right? But there are all kinds of studies that say, yeah, Yes, the time on tech is problematic in its inactivity and, you know, for a variety of reasons, the things that we've covered. It's also the time with tech, like how are you using it? How are you using social media? So are you getting trapped into the compare and despair? Are you scrolling to the point of you feel so gross you can't stand yourself anymore? Because honestly, I've done it. I've been there. My downfall is like pretty kitchens and bathrooms. I mean, <laughs> I will have I will have myself so grossed out by my own house because I don't have these perfect white organized cabinets and you know <laughs> all of this stuff. So how do we develop a relationship with social media that's positive? Well, aim for five or more positive interactions, whether it's a like or a positive comment. And this is research that's come out of BYU. I mean, this yeah. is um, totally blanking on her name. I'm sorry. It's Sarah. I'll help her out here. It's Sarah uh, Coyne. It was interesting to hear her say, like, you know, it's the way that we use it as a tool. So if you do five or more positive interactions with social media, whether it's a, a nice comment, a like, it sets your brain up. It's kind of like that laws of attraction thing. Mm -hmm. You're looking for things that are good and you leave on a high note. I mean, I just talked with David Monahan from Fair Play, which is a fantastic nonprofit organization who advocate tirelessly for children in technology. And his number one healthy screen habit was to end on a high note, like don't scroll to the point where you feel you're starting to feel yucky, like find something that you like 
and decide you're going to stop there. So you leave on that high note, you know? That's so beautiful. there's, I, I loved it too, because honestly, that's what I love about most of my guests is they yeah. give me such great insight to other ways to use tech and other ways to, you know, interact with everything. Okay. So, so you've talked about technological boundaries and if we're talking about the relationship with our children, what are some of the boundaries that maybe you've set up in your own household or that you've heard of other people setting that are more relationship-based or education-based with kids? So I think when you're talking about setting tech boundaries, a lot of times that seems like eating an elephant. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, it's such yeah. a big thing. It's like, where do I even start with this? So I think the best place to start is know that there are tools out there to help you. I'm going to recommend our tool. Our, our tool is a free downloadable tool on our website called the Family Tech Plan. Okay. And what it is really is kind of a springboard of communication for you and your partner as well as to involve the children, it's based upon the age of the, you know, your, your children and your family, but it acts as a, like a conversational springboard of who do we want to be with tech? Who do we like, uh, what's our family philosophy? Because if you can't set the intention, how do you know where you're headed? you know? Yeah. So, but here's the thing. You may look at our version of the family tech plan and be like, that doesn't resonate with me at all. That's fine. It's totally fine. <laughs> it's some people do tech contracts. Some people do tech plans or agreements. Some people sit down and have a signing off of rules, etc. It's really up to you to know what's going to work in your family. Mm -hmm. There are some families who the formalization of a contract is not going to hold water at all. If anything, yeah. it's going to be over controlling for some teenagers and it's going to like, you know, whereas sitting down and kind of having a conversation is going to hit better. So yeah. not, not everybody likes banana bread. So this might not be a good analogy, but I can tell you, I have like five different recipes for banana bread. Right. Mm -hmm. And each person in my family likes like my daughter likes the banana bread with chocolate chips. My husband likes the banana bread with walnuts. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of like recipes for banana bread. It's you, you have to choose the recipe that fits best for your family. So like I said, free tool on our website, but I think it's a great place to start because it starts the conversation. And the thing that I wanted to talk about, what about like having the conversations was mm -hmm. it's important not just to have the one-time conversation. Yeah. These are conversations that they have to be viewed like hydration. It's like little sips of water all the time, right? You can't drink a gallon of water on Wednesday and think that by Saturday, you're going to be fine. You have to little sips of water. Well, so and I appreciate what you said about like talking about the positive things of technology too, because I feel like I've fallen into this trap where all of those conversations, yeah, we are having lots of conversations, but they are negative conversations and they are not building yeah. a relationship. They are, I, they, my kids think it's, it's me against their tech and we're having this tug of war yes. and I, I see it and I'm aware of it. And I still make the mistake sometimes because I'm like, Ah, losing my mind. <laughs> right, right. And it's one of those things that we have to remember that developmentally, our teens are in a place where they prioritize peer relationships over parents. I mean, yeah. this is how it's, yeah. it's how we've evolved as a species, right? Yep. And we have to recognize that the phone holds the key to their peer relationships. Yes. So the tech is going to win. So we have to become allies. You know, you've got to like crack this code a little bit. Yeah. And one of the best ways that I have found to connect with my own teens is to make them the expert. They can teach you a lot because I, I do have a social media account and I do post things. And my daughter had done a picture that I wanted to know how to do that. 
but she was the one that taught me. And so, <laughs> but I, I don't think we should use them only for that. Like, oh, what's the hippest, coolest way to use things. I think the real like truth telling starts coming out when you say, Hey, I just saw this report that stated that most cell phone usage is starting in fourth and fifth grade now. Like, what are your thoughts? And so I've really enjoyed kind of getting their perspective on things. And it helps me both with that most important filter of, you know, connection with my kids, but also it, keeps me grounded in reality of what do they think? What do they care about? You know? So I want to circle back to what you were saying about like, what are the boundaries that people can put up with tech in their house? The absolute no fly on 100% of the time, don't even bother asking me in our house is tech in the bedrooms. If we could get phones out of bedrooms, we would see such a positive impact on mental health, sleep deprivation, so many things. I mean, I'd even go so far as to say like healthier lifestyles overall, because when you're overtired, you're less likely to be active and you're less likely to be curious and looking for things in your outside world. So establish a family charging station at night. I highly recommend it be either in your master bathroom or your master bedroom yeah, far enough away so that, <laughs> yeah, so that it doesn't, doesn't disrupt your own sleep. Keep it across the room from you, but you don't want to, uh, a lot of people say like, oh, it's on the kitchen counter. We have a tech, tech charging yeah. station on the kitchen counter. And I think that is fantastic that they're not sleeping with their phones underneath their pillows, you know, where I know many, many, many teens do on the other hand, like, have you gotten up at 2 AM right. and check to see who's hanging out in the kitchen? Yeah. Because yeah. you, you are not going to win that battle. We have to put up those guardrails. So that's the number one healthiest habit is getting the tech out of the bedrooms. Well, and, and for then, a while I thought, okay, we have screen time that shuts off their phones. It's downtime after this certain time, but kids are smart. Oh, they yeah. like have found all sorts of workarounds, like oh, weird completely. side doors into YouTube through other apps and like, oh, yeah, they're, they, they outsmart me every time. <laughs> Oh yeah. And what's, what's amazing, like to me is how they outsmart me, but it's not coming from a place like devious behavior. It's just, I'm just watching them navigate their world yeah, and like, I'm going, look what I can do. <laughs> how are, I'm like, how are you doing that? Yeah. You know? And they're like, oh, it's just this, this, and that, you yeah. know? Yeah. Since you're all about hope, what are some of the ways that technology enriches our lives and our relationships and our connection? Okay. So what we're doing right here, right? Like video conferencing with each other. I think without this platform, we're currently using zoom, but I mean, we also use Google meet, we use that, you know, without this platform, I think the past two and a half years, but during lockdown, Wow. I think it would have been very difficult for my children not to see their grandparents, not to see, I mean, I have parents who are both in their eighties. We didn't want to expose them to anything, but we had a weekly call that, you know, and that was super fun because we incorporated relatives who live across the country from us. And we had like a weekly noontime zoom time call, you know? And so, yeah. And that's something that actually, you know, silver lining from, from the pandemic is that we've continued. We could, we do it once a month now is, you know, so that for sure has helped family stay connected. Yeah. Um, another way that I really enjoy connecting with my college age son is he and I, I have a limit on my social media because with, I can go down the rabbit holes. You show me a duckling and a field of flowers, (laughs) buckle up. I'm there with (laughs) you. you I'm like, maybe some pretty cake decorating. I'm like, 
like, I am, I am with you. Okay. So I know that I have to put some limits on me. So I have limits. So I set certain number of minutes per day and I'm allowed to be Instagram is my, you know, platform of choice. I'm not a Facebooker. (laughs) And then I also try and keep it in time blocks throughout the day. So it's like right after I take my daughter to school. So I do like a morning thing and then like an afternoon thing. So I keep it in two different periods of time. So I'm not on it throughout the day. That's my, that's like my own, my own kind of safety net in there to keep myself from, from just binging. Um, but my son goes to school out of state and he and I will send memes back and forth to each other. Like, I mean, uh, probably two to three a day. And he and I have a very similar sense of humor. So he'll find a new account that is very funny and he'll like send me a clip and be like, you should check this guy out. And, you know, I'll send him some. And so that is a way that he and I have completely stayed connected that I realized my daughter did not have. And my daughter and my son have always, always been very, very tight. And I want to continue that. And so that is also the reason she's learning how to drive. We're also going to take our first steps into social media. And we're like, you know, we just started her own account. And so every family gets to choose it for themselves. Some people say my kid's been on social media since they were 10. Other people say my kid's not going to have any other social media until they're 18. You know, for our family, I want to give her time to have problems with it and still have a safe place to fall so we can help work through things until she's out on her own. The other rule that we have is you have to check in and like with us, we don't post without consent. So anybody whose picture is being posted has been contacted, Mm -hmm. has been contacted by me. It's been shown the picture and said, are you okay if I show this picture on my feed? And so she has had to do that. And sometimes she doesn't want to deal with having to ask people. And so I'm like, just don't use that picture. You know, I appreciate it when, when I don't have, you know, horrible photos of me. (laughs) So that, that also is establishing that like, you know, respect and having, having you be an ally Now my hard, hard pass Snapchat. And I, with my son, I told him I, he was, he was asking for Snapchat early, early on. And I said, I will never, I will never endorse Snapchat in this house. But I recognize that that's how they're all communicating. And sure, he turned 18 and I said, this is your choice. You're, you know, free to do as you, as you wish, as you move out into the world, you know where I stand. (laughs) So. It's one of those things where I recognize that the communication of choice for my son is more in like the DMs and the sharing of like quick little funnies back and forth Mm -hmm. than a long text or a call. And because my daughter did not have the platform, they were starting to lose touch with one another because she would send him a thick text. And he'd reply back with one line just because he's a, he's a guy of few words. He always yeah. has been, but it was very cute to see how excited he was that she was on Instagram now as well. And he's, he immediately set up like a group thing for us to all share like memes on. And he put in a few that he knew she'd like right away. And I was like, okay, this was the right move for this time in our yeah. family. Yeah. But, but we're in a very different place than I was, you know, say when he was 15, she would have been 11. No way. No way. You know, that's so, been my most recent realization. You were talking about the different banana bread and stuff and how every family needs a culture. I have such different ages and such different personalities and each kid has different temptations that for so many years, I tried this one size fits all family rules. And I just more and more realized I needed to customize it. There's, you know, some family rules that, like you said, non-negotiables, and then it's not going to be completely fair, 
but it's going to be customized to the needs of each child. Yeah, I understand exactly what you're saying, even though I only have two. It's up to us to kind of like tease out and figure out what's going to be, you know, the love language of your child, what's going to be the motivator of of your individual child. I I do find that there is a a bit of a gender divide in digital use. And that's that girls trend towards social media, boys trend towards gaming, Mm -hmm. you know, with, and I'm talking about problematic usage, but the shared problematic usage, and I struggle with it too, streaming. And that is any platform on which you stream, whether it's YouTube or, you know, any of the entertainment channels, Netflix, Amazon Prime, any of those, you know, best, healthiest screen habit for that is to turn off the autoplay on any of the streaming networks. They always have a remove autoplay option, but that is a ubiquitous problematic zone. And it makes you a little sick when you go over things that have been brought to public record now where, you know, I mean, the CEO of Netflix has been quoted as as saying that Netflix's biggest competitor is sleep. And so that's talk about putting profits over people. Oh, I know when we know so much about sleep now, the research on how yeah. important it is for lifelong brain health, it's, and to know that you are setting up generations of people for chronic pain, fatigue, health issues, et cetera. So that helps to really get a handle on and set up some healthy habits around streaming. And unfortunately that also goes into porn because the porn streaming is off the charts. When we talk about pornography, we tend to think, oh, that's a boy problem, but it is not. It is boys and girls. And so I encourage people to start having conversations. There are good books out there. There's uh, even for very young children, good pictures, bad pictures, you know, there's, oh yeah. And there's, um, there's Marilyn Evans wrote a uh, online course called Get Off the Fence, which is just talking how to open the conversation around pornography. If you're right. uncomfortable doing so with your yeah. children. I mean, you say the word pornography in a, you know, a group of adults and it's an immediate conversation stopper and people yeah. get a little like, oh, and so kids pick up on this. Oh, this is a bad thing. And so many kids stumble into content that of course it's interesting and confusing and weird all at the same time. And we're coming from a place of just like we talked about earlier, how like we as people try to figure things out. It's like, that's how we're designed. So kids will revisit the porn sites again, like trying to figure out. And then when they do figure out but then the curiosity has been awakened. And this is not a moral, this is not a moral issue. This is not something that I'm telling you what you want to do in your bedroom. This comes from a public health standpoint. Yeah. And that's because when children see something, they try something. And when you're dealing with sexual transactions, it tends to be done with kids who are younger than they are. So we're seeing skyrocketing. Uh skyrocketing children on children's sexual abuse. So I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. But no, <laughs> but no, this is important. It's a, the, yeah. it's a very difficult conversation. Yeah. It is so important to have. Yeah. And yeah. So, and the other thing I have to tell you is there's a, a kind of a frightening statistic and that's that only 12% of teens or kids when they experience something online that they are afraid of or say it's cyber harm they're you know something that that they don't like only 12% of kids will come to their parents oh. for help with it they try and solve the problem themselves and a lot of times that just ends up digging whatever hole they've you know stumbled into it gets deeper and deeper So the driver of why it was such a small number 
is because when you ask kids, was there a reason why you didn't talk to your mom or dad about this? It's because they didn't want to lose their phone. So we've already had the explicit conversation in our house. Like I told you, we just walked through the social media archways with my 15 year old. And I said, you need to know there's stuff on platforms that I know about. I'm sure there's stuff out there that I don't know about. Whatever happens, you will not lose your phone privilege because of the phone in our house is a privilege. It's not a given, right. you know? So, but that being said, you coming to me for help or to tell me something like that you're not comfortable with is will never be a reason of losing a phone privilege. Like the phone is not this, it, you know, comes and goes thing because it goes back to that developmental thing that, yeah. you know, their peer oh, relationships, the connection to their peers supersedes even though we're trying, trying, trying as moms to build this connection, you know, you're never going to win that that developmental stage. It's just not going to happen. So you you got to soak that in when they're five, that's when you're everything to them. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. From what I understand, it comes back a little bit, but it's, (laughs) but, um, I hope if we can get that message out to more parents of telling their kids, if you have a problem online and, you know, come to me with it, it will not result in you losing your phone. Yeah. I think that's going to build a bridge of trust. You know, it's going to be a more secure bridge of reaching out and seeing you as that allyship. Yeah. It's yeah. That and whole, you're not getting I, punished for things that happen accidentally. You're not, you know, like it's again, back to that, just trying to avoid that adversarial relationship. It's mom against tech. She hates tech. Yeah. Yeah. So can you leave us with the reasons behind your hope for technology with families? I think the good that technology brings in our world supersedes the bad. Just like the automobile, 100% changed human transportation forever and shipping. And I mean, so, so many things. When it first started, there were no rules of the road. And sadly, when you look at any type of revolution, whether it was the industrial revolution, or you could say the automotive revolution, unfortunately, the ones who kind of suffer the most have been the ones without voice. Those being the kids. We've all seen the pictures of the yeah. kids in the looms and the, you know, the loss of life and limb. And I mean, when I grew up, it was, I mean, I remember when the seatbelt law passed and I felt like, oh, what is this? You know, well, now we have, that's because it, I mean, the seatbelt all pot was passed for very good reason. The, every child needs to be in the back seat passed for a very good reason. And guess what? Now we have legislation that says, Hey, any car manufactured in the, you know, being sold in the U S you have to have a latch system because our babies are getting thrown through windows. So, you know, now we, we anchor them in, now we have airbags. So there has been a very steep and tragic learning curve on this. We cannot underestimate the damage that's been done to so many families on this time of intensive learning. My hope is that as we move forward, we are coming up with those safety rules. We are redoing things like the Children Online Privacy and Protection Act, which the original set was made in like 1998 when, I mean, barely, I mean, a lot of people didn't even have home computers, you know? So, but now there, we are finally at a point where I think legislators and legislation is catching up. And I really, really hope we can just continue this forward swell of protection. Oh, that is encouraging. Like, I I think just the progress that you've seen is so encouraging. Just, oh, yeah, immensely. Yeah, that's beautiful. Immensely. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. We can do this. <laughs> yes. Yes, we can. It takes a lot of like education building and awareness building and tools, which that's, that's the big thing is if we all stand around and talk about, oh, this is so horrible, what, you know, what can be done. And then as you're walking away, you're handing your toddler the screen and the, the stroller. My ultimate like pie in the sky, you know, they say like, you know, put your, put your dreams out to the universe. Here's my dream. Okay. My dream is that at some point there will be a surgeon general warning on every device sold, just like we did with cigarettes, you know, of use of this device can, you know, and just lay it out. We live in an amazing country. We are given amazing amounts of freedom, but I think it is a, a freedom that is short changed when we are not given all of the information. Mm. So we are also in a world of so much information. It can sometimes get scary. So when it comes from someone like the surgeon general, that is a vetted known source. I, I would love to see a warning on every device, but I think it's coming Whitney. I really do. I believe so hard in parents. They I think it's a like a more tech wise generation that is coming up. I mean, we are, you and I are the first generation to parent through this technology phase, but equally, equally important, we are the last generation to be able to remember the before. Oh boy. Yeah, that, that is important. Yeah. That is really important wisdom that we hold alone. Oh, I had never thought of that. That's eye-opening, isn't it? Okay. Well, yeah, we, we have power. Also great responsibility, right? That's, that's the quote, but <laughs> ability. okay. Yes. Well, thank you, Stanley. <laughs> and just like that, we've come full circle to our superhero analogy. Now let's go out armed with this new information and save the world. Thank you so much for listening to the How She Moms podcast and for being part of this community. There are so many other ways for you to connect and hopefully also contribute. I share tips and ideas regularly on Instagram and Facebook at How She Moms. You can find past episodes and other resources at HowSheMoms.com. And you can always just email me directly at Whitney at HowSheMoms.com. Special thanks to my own wonderful mom, Susan Singley, for recording my theme music. She played this song all the time when I was growing up, and to me, it's the soundtrack of motherhood.